lovely lunch, as I promised Shekhar. We'll try and make sure you don't need coffee to be awake in this session. This is the roundup with a title, Policy Priorities for 2019-24. What are these IPF papers telling us? And we have Professor Devesh Kapoor, Mr. Panda, Professor Desa, and Mr. Suman Biri with us. And uh, we have 90 minutes. What I suggest is uh, each of the panelists takes about seven, eight minutes for the first round. We then open up the session so that we have at least 30 minutes plus for discussions. And the panelists again get another four, five minutes each to respond. And if that plan is broadly okay with everyone, let me just take maybe three, four minutes and try and set the context. I won't attempt summarizing the papers. Most of you have been here, in fact, longer than I think most of us on the dais and have been part of the discussions. We've covered tax policy, macro issues relating to growth, climate vulnerability, healthcare reforms, women and work, exports, besides the remarks of Professor Dixit and the minister. So in a sense, we've covered a fair gamut of issues, factor market, social sector, natural resources, macro stability, foreign trade. So instead of looking at individual sectors, I thought to give some coherence in terms of what should be the policy priorities for 1924, we could focus instead of sectors on a couple of or three or four themes. And some of uh, the themes that I have identified in consultation with our panel are sort of overarching cross-cutting issues. And the suggestion I have is if Devesh is comfortable, he can look at issues relating to state capacity because the policy issues that have jumped out of these papers, each of them uh, clearly opens up questions on state capacity and some of these clearly open up questions both on policy formulation and implementation, not only at the level of the Union of India, but I think states, local governments, so that could be one set of issues. And uh, if I could request thereafter Mr. Panda to focus on the polity. For instance, the sense that I have, notwithstanding a lot of the noise to the contrary, if you take the big sort of uh, big ticket policy issues, GST or PSU banks, an inflation targeting central bank, focus on MSP as a solution to problems of farmers, there is actually remarkable continuity in policies. I'm sure we can find policies where there are sort of movements, but there are a large number of big ticket policies where I do not see too much discontinuity. But there are also a whole bunch of, I think, more difficult, contentious issues. For instance, one issue that I was discussing with Sajid at lunch, if we are all agreed that export competitiveness is seriously hurt by the exchange rate, why isn't there a serious discussion on micro hedging instruments rather than a macro policy of keeping the rupee low? Now, this would still mean continuity on export competitiveness, but a very different way of approaching how do you retain competitiveness? Does it have to be a macro and perhaps often very costly with huge distributional implications of a rupee being kept low rather than a much more micro financial sector oriented exchange rate hedging instruments policy? So perhaps there are issues of this nature where the polity has a different view, the polity 
will offer sort of newer choices in 19 to 24. So if uh, Mr. Panda is comfortable, he could talk about some of these issues. And uh, given uh, Mayor's work of the past, taxation, uh, ease of doing business, uh, the entire informal sector, formalization, and natural resource related questions uh, with Professor Desai. And uh, with, uh, Mr. Berry, my request was if he could focus on the international environment as it's emerging, as it's likely to emerge, and our engagement with international institutions, what does it look like and what does he suggest for 19 to 24? This is broadly what I have in mind, but please feel free to talk about anything that interests you beyond this, as long as we stick to broadly eight, 10 minutes per person. Devesh, i start with you. Uh, so, in uh, keeping with KP's sort of instructions, uh, what I thought was to really focus on governance and state c c capacity, uh, just to sort of uh, help us think uh, how robust are the institutional foundations of the Indian state for sustained growth and 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 development. Uh, so, so I'll just begin with something that we all talk about, accountability. And we all know that in India, the key, perhaps the only real mechanism of accountability is elections. Uh, the other institutions, like the Supreme Court, the Comptroller and, and Auditor General, CBC, CBI, uh, have clearly become, and especially the last, I would say, the CBI, has become as much of, an, of, a, of a mechanism to shake down one's, one's political sort of enemies as it is as an institution of accountability. And uh, other institutions like the media, actually India ranks pretty low and it's been declining. Uh, the role of the court, I'll show you some you know, data uh, <coughs> where the number of cases keeps on skyrocketing and there are hardly any steps being taken to address those issues. One of the things that has happened in the past two decades is there's been a huge growth in the number of regulatory institutions in India. Just, this is just a list, I'm, you know, it's, it's only a partial list. You know, there are all these, uh, if you, the acronyms are so many you can play Scrabble with them. Uh, it's, and on top of this, there's another layer which is regulatory tribunals. We really don't have any good understanding of the role they are playing in the development of the private sector and a whole loss, whole range of micro issues that affect firms, the ease of doing business, etc. cetera. Uh, so we've been working on this issue like for a while and I've been just you know, staggered by, I mean, one of the reasons, and this is about state capacity, these have essentially been captured by the bureaucracy and the and High Court and Supreme Court judges. They've become retirement homes for, uh, for retiring secretaries in the IS and for High Court and Supreme Court judges. But of course, to be appointed like to them, your ex ante, you know, it shapes their ex ante you know, uh, 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 behavior and makes them far more pliable to pressure from the executive branch. Uh, the rule of law, uh, uh, you can, you know, this is the usual thing about the police, the courts, uh, property rights, contracts, and especially uh, where I think there are increasing pro challenges is to rein in arbitrary pressures by agents of the state. So this is some, this is the last the data that I have on backlog in the courts. Uh, <coughs> clearly, very, very high, I mean 60,000 in the Supreme Court, so alone. Uh, uh, in India, as everyone says, you know, it's the process that's the punishment, just the, the excruciating long time it takes to get cases, you know, resolved. Uh, there is, 
an increase in the strength of the state police forces. But actually, India has one of the smallest police forces in the world per million you know, people. In fact, I want to emphasize, India has one of the smallest bureaucracies in the world, period. Uh, the number of people, so you know, usually we say in India we believe in the state, the US doesn't believe in the state. On a per capita basis, the US has five times more personnel uh, in public employment compared like, to India. So here you see with the police, India is way lower than recommended uh, and even the sanction strength. Uh, corruption, I think there's a general sense that uh, there's been a somewhat decline at the central, uh, but little change at the state level. Uh, the capture of the state by elites and private interests has declined, that's somewhat of a question mark, but there's some sense that the bankruptcy law has helped. Uh, but again, as I said, uh, these arbitrary inquiries is paralyzing you know, decision making in the public sector. A whole range of, of, the, of the bureaucracy is afraid in taking decisions lest they be challenged uh, uh, a few years down the road. Uh, these weaknesses will persist, uh, and I'll just go over this very rapidly because of political incentives, weak human resources, uh, a system you know, design, and a lack of exit mechanisms. Uh, who wants strong institutions? Yes, in the IPF, we all want strong institutions, but it's really unclear if politicians and bureaucrats want them because, of course, it'll constrict them. Uh, there is, you could argue that, I that I in a democracy, it should come from public pressure, but I think that's very unlikely. Uh, on human resources, the Indian state has a personnel policy on hiring, salary, and pensions transfers, but it does not have a human resource you know, strategy. Where are the personnel uh, uh, you know, that you need to nurture and, and to, 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 to like develop? It's increasingly relying on contract workers. Uh, one uh, study says that about 40% of all uh, central government employees are contract workers. Uh, in the federal civil service, what you'll see is, uh, the, since independence, the population has increased four times. The number of fe federal uh, sort of employees, uh, you know, taken, you know, uh, with the exam, has only doubled, and the number of people taking the exam has increased by an order of magnitude. So, in principle, it's a far more selective system. Uh, but if you, if you go down to the lower bureaucracy, this is results from the Maharashtra primary teacher test results. You can see the huge numbers that take the exam and just 1% manage to pass an exam to teach primary school children. Uh, just passing the exam, right? It's an abysmally low rate. Uh, it's an understaffed but over-bureaucratized state. Uh, government employment peaked in 1991. Since then, India has added 400 million more people. Its uh, public sector employment has declined by 10%. It added more people in the last 25 years than it had at the time of independence. Uh, and, 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 and you see this across the board. That that's, that's some data on tax or employment. Uh, vacancies, I'll just take you through some numbers that give you a sense of vacancies across the board in the Indian state. That's in the IAS. Uh, that's in the courts, where it's about 25%. That's in the police forces. Uh, that's in the army, all branches of the army. It's about 20 to 25%, especially the, the lower officer corps. Uh, the number of central government personnel actually declined between 2006, 2010, increased somewhat between 2010 to 2020, with one notable ex exception, the Ministry of Home Affairs. Almost <clears throat> between 2006 and 14, the personnel increases in the central paramilitary forces was more than six times the net increase in personnel of the entire central government. So now, uh, the strength of these relative to the army and the police, in 1998, these are the numbers this is 2015. 
So one of the single largest increases in government employment is actually the central paramilitary forces. Uh, we did a study on something at local level. This is the, the BDO offices across the country. The average number, they serve a population of about a quarter million. They have about, on average, about 25 people. And virtually every central scheme passes through a BDO's office. They are severely understaffed. And even here, you have vacancies, even with these small numbers, of about 20 to 25%. The, the system can't even spend the money that is thrown at it. Uh, you see very low rates of being the ability to spend, whether in health or education, uh, or even something like defense. Every single year over the past 15 years, the capital budget in the defense you know, budget has been severely underspent. Uh, partly, and I'll just finish, KP, I'll just take two more minutes. Uh, systems have remained unchanged. That's the structure of the police. Uh, only 1% is officers, 13% are upper so subordinates who have some level of you know, training. 86% is the lower constable, which is very poorly trained, uh, and that's the vast bulk of your police. And that too is very understaffed. Uh, <clears throat> there's a, been, of course, one of the severe problems of the Indian state, it doesn't know how to exit. You know, even we can go without food, but we can't go without expelling our waste. And there's a lot of waste in this you know, system. Uh, each time we add more programs, they just get added on. We've counted about 150 programs that go through the district administration. I'm sure the number has changed. You look at Air India, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, it's a losses the past 15 years, 60,000 crores. But even now, there's an unwillingness to sell. Uh, Calcutta Port, uh, its share of tra traffic has gone down from 28% to 2.6%. It has a, a, a productivity of about 2% of Singapore Port, yet it has 3,000 acres of prime land in Calcutta in a place where land is so difficult to get. Uh, meanwhile, they have spent about 11,000 crores in dredging the river Hooghly for a port that will never survive. So inability to let go. Uh, conclusion, I think, I would argue that the most pressing challenge to India's future is the state of public institutions that underline the Indian state. And I believe that India will face much more severe challenges in maintaining political order from a range of pressures, whether it's demographic, urbanization, the skills and aspirations, mismatches that are emerging. Uh, the systems of order that came from Indian society, caste system, family hierarchies, they are, they are eroding, which is very good, but the commensurate increase in strengthening public institutions is not happening. Uh, and then, of course, you have the effects of climate change. Thank you. Thanks, Devish. And now, can I request Mr. Panda? From here, sir. Yeah, if you don't mind. I'm fine, fine, sir. Thank you. My perspective is going to be uh, from a different uh, position, although I agree with almost everything that Devesh just presented. Uh, and I'd like to qualify that although I've been in parliament for four terms, my opinions shouldn't be taken as typical. I continue to be a maverick, and many of these opinions will face resistance inside the political system, although uh, some of them are getting traction gradually. The first thing that it's so obvious but keeps getting uh, missed by analysts and at conferences like this uh, is the obvious lack of bandwidth at a union level, at the highest executive legislative levels. Uh, because, you know, for example, there were a set of expectations when this current government came into office in 2014, and many people, including many in this room, probably think that it has grossly underperformed, without keeping in mind the simple fact that it didn't have a majority in the upper house. And facing a very, very determined opposition, legislative changes were near impossible. So the expectations should be 
that a really focused, determined government, even one that has a majority once, which has happened once every three decades, as it happened, uh, can only get so much done. And if they focus on a few big ticket items, get one or two done, which would have cascading effect over the years, is what really we should be expecting, rather than a whole plethora of policy changes. So I believe that just like the 91 government led by Narasimha Rao is remembered for uh, bringing about an inflection point in India's economic policies with really doing away with industrial policy, industrial licensing, I mean. Uh, similarly, GST is going to be the imprimatur of this government and will be remembered for many, many decades as being a very, very vital inflection point. Not that other things haven't happened. A few things have happened. We've talked about the bankruptcy law, um, some changes in FDI norms here and there. Uh, but this challenge will remain because the governments don't have tenure in our system. And separately, I keep arguing, many, many people like me keep arguing for streamlining of the election system. I personally have advocated some constitutional amendments to have a two-cycle election system as, as in the US, with half the states aligned with the national election and the other half uh, in a midterm. Uh, this, unless we do that, we have, in my opinion, the world's highest ratio of campaigning to governance. I do not believe any other country has anywhere close to the ratio that we have of campaigning to governance. We need to invert that ratio. Unless we do that, uh, we are not going to be making much progress on many of these things. Now, if we look at the core fundamental changes that we require, apart from election streamlining, uh, streamlining the funding of politics, uh, we need judicial reforms and police reforms, as Devesh was talking about. If we don't get to the core of this, uh, a lot of the other stuff that, we're going to, that we are talking about, and I will mention some of the other stuff, is not going to happen. Having said that, what should we expect over the next five years? Uh, a lot will depend on whether there is a government that has a, a single party majority, as is the case today. Uh, many commentators don't expect that. But is it going to go back to a situation of coalition governments without a single party being a nucleus uh, and a single strong leader? In which case, we could go back to the years of policy paralysis and not much else happening. There may be some broad continuity in policy intentions over the decades, but in terms of implementation, it hasn't been smooth implementation. If you look at the last 27 years, you'd have something in 1991, something in 1997 to do with telecom, something to do with uh, maybe 2003 or 4, and perhaps uh, last couple of years with GST. Uh, so it's going to be in fits and starts uh, and those fits and starts can get less frequent. I mean, we can get more done if there is uh, political stability at the top, but that is for the people of India to decide. If I had my druthers, if a government were to be able to push through a few things, um, apart from the fundamental ones of judicial reform, police reform, and uh, political parliamentary and election reform, I would say something like labor law. I come from a private sector background, and I know that I used to bend over backwards to not employ people. And I know many people who may not say this so bluntly, but that's what they do, because of the hassles of having to deal with the system. And unemployability, or un unemployment rather, is the single biggest challenge that any Indian government is going to face over the next two decades. A Couple of gentlemen participating here have uh, advocated UBI and have uh, encouraged me to, to champion a universal basic income in India. And although it got uh, written about in the economic survey last year, it's not something that has got political traction yet. Uh, we have very, very se serious challenges in the agriculture sector. And you know, an MSP rise may not seem appealing to economists, but these are the urgent decisions that any politically inclined party in government will have to deal with. Now, if they could also parallelly deal with structural reforms in agriculture, it would be worthwhile. 
if, if people get away by thinking that we do an MSP rise and that gets us through the next elections and we don't have to bother with the structural reforms that agriculture requires, uh, Telangana is doing something that's very innovative using cash transfers, uh, not on crop uh, basis but on land basis. These are the, these are the creative policy angles that we should think of. Last, I mean, I could go on and talk a lot. Two things I just want to flag off, and we can discuss this later on in Q&A. One is we desperately need devolution, over-centralized. Uh, there is some shift happening with more money going to panchayats. The panchayats have seen a very significant shift in funding available to them. Uh, you know, going from about a uh, couple of thousand dollars a year to about a hundred thousand dollars a year. Now, it's not accompanied by uh, similar devolution of authority and administrative ability and capacity building. So just money is not going to do it. Uh, you're going to have to make those changes. One final thought, there's a new uh, experiment that started with lateral entry with uh, 10 slots being identified at joint secretary level in the government for lateral entry from non-government sources. This was preceded by two or three years of about half of the joint secretaries being empaneled not from the IAS which are the Brahmins among the uh, Indian uh, national uh, civil services, but from the other allied services. These are good directions, but baby steps. They need to be uh, enhanced, they need to be pushed forward much more if we are to shake up the system and get it to be much more effective. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We here. Thanks so much. It's a great pleasure to be here, and congratulations to uh, uh, Shaker and Karthik for organizing a great conference. Uh, in particular, I thought the variety of papers was really fantastic. Um, so uh, I want to take uh, Mr. Krishnan at his word and let me talk a little bit about anything I'd like to talk about, um, but in the spirit of talking about uh, markets and firms. And what I want to take you through is a couple of things. The first thing is I want to take you through two alternative narratives that have emerged over the last day or two about India's growth trajectory. Um, I want to talk about why each of those narratives has a problem and then suggest an alternative narrative. And uh, then finally suggest that that alternative narrative might make more sense and um, by, doing, by raising a set of questions. And then I'll return to policy. So um, we've heard two uh, very strong narratives about what is going on in India. Um, first uh, from Poonam's paper yesterday and then today from Sajid's paper, I think. So the first narrative that emerges, I think, is the dominant narrative. It's this picture. Uh, and this picture is a very powerful picture. Um, I don't have my own slides. I'm just, I'm just stealing Poonam's slides for these purposes. Um, this is the dominant picture. You see, uh, quote unquote, the Hindu growth rate. You see post-liberalization, 91. You see it step up by a point. And then we have the the great years, the 8.8% years um, that go from 01, 02, all the way to 08 or 07. And then you have a slightly lower number for the most recent period. And then uh, what emerges from this narrative, of course, is uh, what's gonna happen next? Is it gonna be seven or eight? Um, that becomes kind of the dominant uh, question. And so the reason to think hard about that, of course, is because these narratives matter. Uh, in particular, I think Abhijit, raised a really important point in passing yesterday, which is the fiscal math is hard to make sense of. Uh, the only way to make the fiscal math work is with 7 8% growth. And so um, the question is if that's, is if that's realistic. So um, what uh, I think um, Sajid's narrative is effectively a different one, which is uh, that golden period, uh, and these are again Poonam slides, but I think they tell your story, Sajid, which is um, that golden period um, is basically India's levered to the global economy, right? So Sajid's whole point is exports, 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 exports triggered investment, exports and investment contribute to the rise in GDP, that's the story, and you see that, um, you see that to some degree here, which is you see India's um, uh, effectively rising with the global economy, then suffering, and then rising again, although Sajid points out not as much as we might have expected, and that's his real exchange rate uh, story, I think, largely. So here's a story about um, basically India's growth is coming from leverage to the uh, global economy. I think that's one way to think about that. And of course, the previous narrative is silent on it, but it really kind of says that the domestic economy, consumption, we're becoming like China, that's the story. 
So the kind of uh, alternative I just want to highlight is, is really is to focus it on investment. Because unlike Sajid, I don't care as much about exports, I care about investment for all kinds of reasons. He says exports trigger investment. I'm not sure that's true. Uh, this, of course, is that large ramp up in investment that happened during that period. Very, very important and then has come down since then. So, um, and by the way, that increase in investment during that period is really abnormal, even relative to emerging market economies. These, again, are Poonam slides. Um, but let me just suggest uh, a different narrative. The most interesting picture I saw was in Poonam's paper, and it didn't make it into her slides, so I can't show it to you. But it is the um, S-curve of credit to GDP. There's a complete S-curve on credit to GDP over the last 20 years. And effectively what happens is, if you look at that, in 2001, credit to GDP is at 20%, and by 2011, credit to GDP is at 50%. It's literally that big a deal. You can look at it in the picture. It's remarkable. So um, what does that suggest? Here's a new, more, more muted version of this, um, which is um, you see how fast domestic credit is growing in India relative to um, emerging markets. And of course, that, in my view, actually triggers the investment. So here's an alternative narrative. The alternative narrative is um, a credit boom uh, that triggered an investment boom that led to extreme outperformance and um, subsequently has tempered off because credit has been shut off effectively. And just to see how credit has been shut off, again, um, this is, you know, uh, this is just the picture I was talking about earlier, a slightly different way. This is real credit growth, again, from her paper over that period. You see this incredible amount, literally kind of 20, 30% credit growth during those boom years. And of course, it's kind of come down to, to being very small. So, um, and then of course, also there's forbearance during that period on the NPAs, as we all know now, um, which is what something she showed as well with gross NPA to gross advances ratio. And of course, you can trace this to the public sector banks in part, in large, because public sector banks expanded their balance sheet so amazingly during that period, and of course have now uh, no longer doing so. So the alternative narrative in short is, I think, clear, which is uh, a credit-induced investment boom that may not be related to fundamentals that has ended and was associated with a one-time period of credit to GDP ratios increasing from 20 to 50 percent, which is, you know, obviously a much more depressing narrative than the ones uh, we've heard so far. So I apologize for that. Um, what the reason why I think it's important is the other two narratives, in particular the first one and even the second one, the questions they leave me with are, in particular, you know, where are the firms? So my big puzzle about all this is where are the firms? And so what do I mean by that? Um, I mean, where are the great Indian firms? Where are the great exporters? Where are the great Indian multinational firms? Where are the great large capitalization companies? I don't see them. So, and this is obviously very speculative, but you know, a couple of clear facts. Uh, India has $100 billion market cap company now, TCS. Um, it's way underrepresented if you looked at the top 50 market cap companies. Um, in the export world, where are the great exporters? Uh, Maruti Suzuki is now, I think, uh, the largest uh, Indian car exporter. It's a trivial fraction of their overall production, something like 50,000 units. Uh, it's not terribly uh, large. And we would have expected to see a lot more. <laughs> I would have expected to see a lot more big, prospering, large, firms. I don't see them. I would have seen, have seen a lot. If you compare it to China, you can look at any kind of table of market capitalizations or uh, large firms, you just don't see it. You don't see large exporters and you don't see large outbound FDI. Um, you, you really don't see any very large outbound FDI. Um, and the inbound FDI is large relative to what it used to be, but it's still not um, very large. So I think the question I'm left with and the question that I think is the most interesting is where are the firms? Uh, and I don't know. Um, and so I think that has a couple of implications. If you buy this alternative narrative, by the way, the alternative narrative would have helped explain this, which is it was just a gross misallocation burst of credit. It went in all kinds of places, not in terribly good places. It didn't lead to kind of um, a real vibrant set of firms. Um, so what does that mean from a policy perspective? So, you know, first I think uh, Mr. Krishnan's comments um, tee this up, which is how much has really changed in terms of policy? 
think we want to ask that question, especially at the firm level. Um, um, labor reforms would be something to think about. Privatization would be something to think about. Has policy changed enough on the ground to really impact uh, real firm performance? And I'm particularly interested in large firms. Um, I think they're very, very important, and I think they're underappreciated for how important they are in the economy. Um, and so the question really is, where are large firms and why is policy not adapted to the things they need? It also, I think, sets a research agenda of sorts, which is, um, I think we need to understand, understand corporate behavior much better than we do. Uh, and we need to understand large corporate behavior much better than we do. I think we know far, far more about the returns to micro-lending than the returns to corporate investment, like 10x. And I think micro-lending is important, don't get me wrong, but uh, corporate investment is really, really important, and we don't know much about it. So, um, you know, in short, I think uh, there are these alternative narratives about growth. I, I think uh, we won't know uh, until we meet in 10 years which of those narratives is right. And I don't mean to lay out an, a depressing one, but it does beg a set of questions for policy and for research about corporate behavior that I think are, um, I think are unanswered. Thank you. Mr. Berry. Um, thank you, Dr. Krishnan. Um, I, I will start by thanking um, uh, Shekhar and Karthik for giving me this platform. And since I have it, I must start by um, acknowledging, uh, since Shekhar has been generous to me um, over this uh, seminar, acknowledging what a joy it is to see the India Policy Forum really become a policy forum. Uh, it has matured and it has um, uh, developed these various bells and whistles which make it more of a policy forum than just a research conference. So congratulations to you, Shekhar, the whole team, Karthik, for uh, the rude uh, health that uh, the venture is in. Um, the brief was to look at the papers for what they have to say for, um, uh, for the future, for, for the next government. But along the lines of what I've said, which is that the policy forum now is more than just the papers, I am also going to draw upon uh, the remarks of the minister and the remarks of um, uh, Professor Dixit in, um, uh, in thinking ab about, uh, about the implications for the future. Um, if I could be allowed to look back uh, in order to look forward, um, let me first uh, go to what uh, Minister Prabhu had to say, which is that the agenda evolves. He was talking of power. I think uh, my take with a five-year absence is slightly different from uh, the, the meme or theme of continuity of both uh, 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 the chair and me here. Um, you know, I think if you're away from the scene from four or five years, you do get the sense that things move on. This was uh, demonstrated in the discussion we had on um, Ela's paper. Well, uh, I don't know who the lead author was, but you know, essentially that we are looking at financial savings, but the context in which we're looking at financial savings has changed. And, and, and if any of the growth numbers are right. Obviously, the entire context has, has changed. Um, and so um, the issues that should concern us um, looking ahead uh, would be very different, I think, from the issues of, uh, of the past, and uh, Mihir has pointed uh, to, to some of them. I think, um, again, uh, Mihir talked of two narratives. I think we were exposed to two very different narratives on growth. There was uh, the rather upbeat view of Punam, which uh, uh, Mihir has drawn upon, but put a different interpretation on, which is that India's growth has uh, stabilized and uh, uh, become more rooted, perhaps because of the uh, shift in shares. And then Vijay's equally appropriate uh, comeback, which is that there's more to development that grow than growth. And as his book indicates, he sees a long road ahead. I'm not saying that one is right or one is wrong, but uh, India is large and important and complex enough that each of us has to, in a sense, make our own judgment of which of those narratives is a better basis for thinking about the future. 
For myself, there are, you know, a few, as it were, leitmotifs or continuities uh, which I keep returning to um, as I think about um, India's journey, as it were. Uh, one is a comment by Tarun Khanna way back in 2002 in a McKinsey special where he said that if you look closely, and he was, uh, may, it may have been slightly later than 2002, but he did say that, look, um, at the in, end of the day, if you look at what's been going on in India, um, it's been uh, characterized by the gradual withdrawal of the state from economic activity, whereas uh, in the case of China, the successes have been because of the state. Now, China and India have moved on a, a long way, and, and of course, we know that uh, in China, there's a very vibrant private sector, of the, uh, not just a state sector, but I still think that uh, it's a useful lens within, it, within which to see where we are and where we might go to ask ourselves the question of whether the uh, consensus on the gradual withdrawal of the state from economic activity still remains a theme uh, or, or, or not. My final observation for the past, before I move on to the future, um, was, uh, I, I can't quite cite all the examples uh, from the last two days, but it was very forcibly borne home to me when I was at Shell that India always, or Indian analysts always think of us as being you know, extreme outliers, and uh, clearly in terms of female labor participation, we are. But in lots and lots of ways, we are surprisingly in the middle of the pack. And in contrast to the kind of picture that uh, the Vesh has painted of crumbling institutions, what that says to me is that there is some source of underlying resilience in the society in the decision-making system, in the society. Maybe that comes across as continuity, but it's a little bit like, uh, what was the old game, Bagatelle, that there are buffers that keep the, the balls kind of, sort of, on the channels. So where does that lead me? I mean, it leads me uh, to a general sense that India, to use Ruchi's term, will not be a breakout nation, but it probably will not be a breakdown nation either. Um, so uh, that is, as it were, an assessment from the past. Now to turn to the assignment in my last two minutes um, from, um, from the um, chair. Some of you may wonder why I've got the name of a well-known Belgian artist on my, uh, uh, on my lapel badge. Uh, Bruegel is actually a European think tank, and they uh, have appointed me as a non-resident um, uh, fellow uh, because they wanted to expand their footprint in India. What I've been doing for them is a, um, a review of the G20 and more broadly on the institutions of global governance um, um, at this moment in time. The assignment actually was just as Mr. Trump was getting going and of course the assignment has evolved um, substantially in the course of the last year, uh, including of course the, 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 the fragmentation of the, of the G7. But what I wanted to share with you uh, are two or three things and then I'll close. One is that India is seen as, rightly, as a big and important economy, and, but one that is very hesitant about its place uh, in the world. Um, I have not been in, uh, in the councils to know what is the source of this hesitance, but the, the fact of the matter is that from, in a sense, being free riders on the global, uh, on the global governance system, we probably are going to have to play a more important role. So as I look ahead, it seems to me that the international challenges divide themselves into two overlapping circles in a Venn diagram. One is, how do we decide or define a policy, our policy towards China? And secondly, how is it that we de devise our policy towards various multilateral institutions, of which I would argue uh, trade is obviously uh, front and center, but I would also say that for India to take more of an interest in the discussions going on on migration, 
given what has happened, is actually of fairly substantial importance to it. Um, in trade, I've been in various discussions outside India on, uh, on the reform of the WTO. I've also been at um, discussions on um, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. And I'm sorry to say, and I'm not well equipped enough to um, defend India's corner, India is seen as an obstructive pain. And the question of whether being an obstructive pain is what s will serve us well in the future uh, is, I think, something that uh, uh, we should ruminate on. Again, the G20 is an instrument. It's an instrument that's been dominated by the G7, but we know where the G7 is at the moment. And so I think the issue of issue-led variable geometry is something that I'm kind of struggling with. Nobody quite knows what it means. But there was a little hint of why that might be important in the climate paper, where it was indicated that uh, you know, the rich countries are unlikely to take on the burden that, that they ought to, and that India may need to put other things on the table in its negotiations, perhaps at the G20 or perhaps in other fora, in order to as it were, uh, shift the debate to a broader debate that includes both climate and uh, development. I've oh, exceeded my time, but I did want to make one final point, which is that both in Minister Prabhu's point, uh, presentation and, of course, implicit in uh, the marvelous talk by Professor Dixit, but much more uh, uh, richly discussed in his book on the making of economic policy, there was this challenge about, look, don't give us ideal solutions, give us solutions that are rooted in the Indian reality. And so my, uh, 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 my takeaway from that for future IPFs and IPF papers is that uh, presenting ideal solutions, not that we do, but that thinking more systematically about the distributional aspects, the implementation aspects, um, the political economy aspects, could well be uh, an integral part of, of, the, of, uh, of the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Berry, and thanks all the panelists. We now have about 30 odd minutes for discussions, remarks, the floor is open. Yes, sir. Professor Bardhan. Since this is the session, I suppose, to talk about big issues rather than technically narrow issues. Um, so as I was listening to the different speakers, uh, this following thought came to me, which is often recur in my own thoughts. Uh, so when Debesh uh, talked about various kinds of institutional failures, and I think uh, Vajan Panda also referred to that without doing some reforms on the institutional front, I'm giving institutions a general name, uh, we, will be in tr we are in trouble looking at the future. Uh, and then uh, both Mihir and, and Suman talked about impact on growth, etc. I remember many years back when I gave, I don't remember which year, I think Suman was, was in charge of this, um, I gave the India Policy Forum lecture and on institutional failures, actually, the kind of things Devesh talked about. Um, and I remember Bimal Jalan was in the chair. Uh, way, back. No? Way, uh, way before. And at that time, the way before, the reason I think is because at that time growth rate was quite high. So Bimal said, why are you so worried about what I call governance failures? Oh, we are doing fine in growth. Okay? We probably wouldn't say that today, but... He, and I essentially then thought about it, and I think it's not just about the growth rate. What these institutional failures point out is what it is doing to the quality of our democracy, the quality of our civic political life, not just a growth rate. If our growth rate 
becomes 8%, 9% tomorrow, I will still remain unhappy if our quality of society, and unfortunately I think in the last few years, our quality of democracy is declining in various ways. And I'm much more worried about that. And that is linked more with the institutional failures, and not just those failures, there are political failures. And all of them have policy implications, but I would essentially, the main reason I wanted to intervene, growth rate is extremely important for all kinds of reasons, but I think we should keep it a larger perspective what it is doing to our society and the quality of democracy in particular. Um, having made this big uh, issue, let me make a small issue which is related to Mihir's. I've also often thought about it, why, where are the farms? The question that Mihir raised. In general, of course, we all know that compared to many other developing economies, India's problem is in quite often small size. You know, we don't have big farms. We don't have big dynamic farms. And of course, immediately my friend says labor law. Uh, I would actually, by the way, labor law since it's now been changed in three or four states, I, I would like a study of comparative study of whether how much of a big change has happened in the three or uh, those three and four states. I myself for long believed labor law is a constraint but is not a binding constraint. There are other constraints which are much more important but that's a personal opinion. I don't want to go into that right now. But in general, uh, there is a public impression that we have missed the bus of labor-intensive industrialization and different people div give different uh, explanations of it. Some people believe it's labor laws. Uh, but in that respect, this, this not having large farm is, the is also a main issue. And these economies of scale are also the more labor-intensive. And that aspect uh, is not often studied enough in terms of empirical uh, examination. Small-scale deservation we have got rid of, but even then uh, it has not done much. But let me, I'm, I'm taking too much time, let me stop there. Thank you, sir. I thought I'll go even-handed because there's no one from this side. So maybe I'll ask Professor Rajaraman. I was originally going to ask Devesh Kapoor a question, but since uh, uh, Pranab referred to the quality of our democracy. Uh, let me take advantage of the presence of uh, Jay Panda, a parliamentarian of long standing, a much respected parliamentarian, um, about his reactions to a particular study that I recently did, and I'll just take a couple of minutes to, de to describe that study. Uh, as you know, GST was introduced on the 1st of July, uh, 2017. And the initial des design that it had in the first quarter was nothing short of disastrous. Um, I wrote on it, many people wrote on it. The great thing about the GST as it progressed to what it is today is that there has been continued uh, uh, willingness to reform uh, the GST uh, in accordance with the feedback that was received from the field. So that's the most uh, uh, heartening aspect of this whole thing. But what I did uh, in order to investigate the role of parliament in this whole thing was that I looked at um, the questions that were asked in parliament uh, in the monsoon session, which was soon after the introduction of GST, and in the winter session of 2017. Uh, Many of you may not know, there's something called questionnaire hour in parliament, and uh, these questions are selected randomly uh, from the uh, number of questions asked, and, and they are divided into the five days of the working week. Uh, so using that random property, uh, I very audaciously inferred something about the party composition of the universe of questions asked uh, from the party composition of the questions actually taken up for answering using the random property of selection. And I found uh, that the probability of a member of the ruling party, namely the BJP, uh, asking uh, uh, a question critical of GST uh, was uh, almost the same as the, as the probability of an opposition member asking a question about GST. And I found this, Pranop, um, a very heartening commentary on the quality of inner party democracy, 
in our country. But here we have a party in power whose members in parliament feel as free. Uh, there is they, they, the, prob the probability of their asking a question on GST was the same as that of an opposition member asking a question on GST. Uh, I thought this was uh, something useful that I uncovered. And what I wanted to ask uh, Mr. Panda's reaction was, uh, does he find that uh, finding plausible? Uh, before I, I let you answer the question, uh, let me also add that you know, f uh, people who are not Indian here uh, may not know that there's something called an anti-defection law operating in parliament, whereby once a member is elected to parliament, uh, in their voting pattern, they have to conform to the party uh, line uh, and not to what is best for their constituents. So they, they cannot vote against the party line. So every vote in parliament uh, conforms to what in the House of Commons would be a three-line whip. That is, every member of that party has to vote in accordance with the party line. So um, with the anti-defection law in place, uh, th uh, the quality of democracy Pranob, did decline. Uh, but here in question R, I have, um, you know, uh, uh, empirical evidence of the fact that ordinary infantry foot soldiers in the BJP uh, who have been elected to, to, to parliament on a, on a valid BJP ticket uh, fell, felt as um, uh, free to ask a question of their own party uh, in, in power uh, why the GST had taken the form it had and why it was having the kind of negative impacts it had. So they were responding to their constituents and what their constituents had told them rather than the party line which was that everything was just great. Let me also add that the response of the Minister of Finance to these questions was as, from, from their own party members, was as brusque and dismissive uh, and rude, actually. Uh, you know, single word answers, you know, has this had a negative impact? No, uh, and so on. So um, uh, it, it, it was not as though, um, you know, the, these, these, these own party questions were treated uh, in a more lax way uh, than questions from the opposition. Uh, but this, uh, as I said, was, was inspired by Pranob's remark, and I'd really like uh, Mr. Panda's uh, response to that, whether, whether my reading of this is at all correct. Thanks. Now, Dilip, but shorter questions. These have been five-minute interventions. Ma'am, not only did you ask a question, I think you answered Professor Bardhan's question as well as your own question. But, Dilip. So, on the issue of state capacity and governance, I, I agree with Pranab that you know, it's, it's probably the most important issue facing the country today, not only for the sake of the democracy, but I think eventually, in the long run, growth will also depend on the quality of institutions. Now, I think and the other topic uh, of this session was sort of important policy priorities for the next five or 10 years. I just wanted to highlight three areas that I think where there is hope that something could be done. I think there's concrete possibility some areas changes have started. So let me start with the first one. Information technology, the possibility of improving public administration, uh, both to reduce corruption as well as to improve the quality of services. So we could actually probably manage with a low number of bureaucrats. Uh, the possibility of, uh, of uh, direct transfers versus distortionary transfers, getting rid of you know, minimum support prices and actually uh, having information on individual farmers and their land and so forth, the kind of structural reforms that were referred to. Second, organizational reforms within the public sector. So we heard in the uh, session on, on healthcare yesterday, the last mile problem is the problem. The district hospitals work fine. It's the primary health clinic. Similarly, in the education system, the Kendriya Vidyalas, I think, work fine. It's the primary schools that are a problem. So why, what is it that permits one part of the system to perform so much better than the other? Uh, I think that is, that's, that's, I think, possibility for organizational reforms. And last, uh, really glaring, especially in contrast with China, urban local governance. Uh, I think we've made some progress with the 73rd uh, Amendment uh, implementation, but not the 74th. Uh, urban local governance is sorely, sorely weak and lacking, partly due to a lack of devolution, lack of willingness of state governments to devolve to urban local governments. Govind Rao and Richard Bird have an excellent paper on this. Uh, problems with financing, especially the use of property taxes, and incentives, uh, creating, you know, and the Chinese have done a great 
job in terms of creating appropriate incentives for the mayors of local governments through the promotion system. I'm not saying that that's going to necessarily work in India, but that's something that I think we could give some attention to. I have a question that's more just trying to be a little bit provocative, and I hope it's not totally tangential to the conversation, but there are so many comparisons with India and China, and I think for very good reasons, and there are lots of things to try to learn from them as well, but in some ways it feels like the comparison is just a little bit false or unfair to India. I mean, if you, uh, you know, compare India and China, they're just different on so many dimensions, but a place like Nigeria, I think, is much more similar to India than China is. And so I wonder if we should be doing more to try to learn from countries that have more similarities in terms of ethno-linguistic variation, federal structure, uh, history that's relevant to kind of, uh, in particular, uh, implementation and governance and those type of systems now um, than we do. So, just a thought. Thank you. Dr. Balla. Thank you. I, you know, I have a question, actually a very rich discussion, and therefore I have a question for each one um, of the participants in it. Um, first with uh, Devesh, that do you think that you know, the staffing is much lower than it should be completely agreed? Are we constrained from expanding it because of international markets that give a lot of importance to fiscal deficit or by the RBI, which gives a lot of importance to fiscal deficit? So what are constraints for the very obvious uh, deficiencies um, in just the hiring and we, we all of us believe that employment is a problem uh, so therefore that's one uh, question um, for Jay if you know I completely agree with you that uh, the uh, downside uh, may be considerable but let's uh, on the upside if there is one party rule uh, that is one party obtains a majority do you expect significant reforms uh, or you, do you expect reforms to accelerate? Um, then uh, a question jointly uh, to both Mihir and um, Suman, uh, which I thought was sort of contradicting each other, but you guys can resolve it uh, for all of us. Um, first, and I think Suman pointed this out or indirectly, that two points about the growth rates. Um, if the growth rates are so similar, uh, 2003 to 2007 and 2014 onwards, um, maybe one percentage point lower uh, in 2014 onwards, and we had two successive droughts, which is about the, only the fourth time in Indian history since 1871 that we've had severe droughts, so a drought is defined as less than 10 percent. You had demonetization, which was obviously uh, disruptive, uh, and you had GST implementation, which has its own. So uh, has our growth rate really gone down? And second, that if you now take in global growth, we all agree that global growth has gone down. Our growth rate has maintained the same. So what explains uh, the fact that uh, we are close to the fastest growing economy in the world today, if, uh, um, and that leads to my last point, I thought, uh, you know, the fact that we don't have a hundred billion dollar firm, what has that got to do with the price of tomatoes? Um, you know, we also, our per capita income is one fourth that, since you're meaning in dollars and not PPP dollars, one fourth that of China. Uh, what is the indicator that that will tell us uh, about, uh, about our performance in any dimension whatsoever? And lastly, and this is a question for all of us, um, we all believe institutions matter. Uh, I don't think institutions are that, uh, I think institutions are completely endogenous. Uh, not exogenous, and we have gone through, I, I guarantee you, you took a poll of 1.3 billion people in India and 7 billion people in the world, they will all say that institutions in India have gone down systematically. And yet, we, if you want to look at the growth rate or education or several other indicators, that it has systematically gone up in India. So, um, you know, 
to invoke institutions uh, when everything else fails, I, I think is uh, uh, somewhat problematical. Thank you, Sajid and Sajid. One, Sorry, on labor laws and jobs, um, between 2004 and 2011, we had the highest growth rate uh, that India has ever experienced. And there were only 11 million jobs created between 2004 and 2011. Sajid? Thank you very much. I just want to pick up from where Mehir left. I think Mehir did a good job summarizing the debate. But I would say I think it's hard to look at 15 years and have two clean models of, or two clean narratives. I think at the macro level, all of these variables are highly endogenous, simultaneously determined investment, exports, credit, they're all the same thing. What I will observe is I think to attribute the 2003 to 8 growth spurt as being uh, a credit boom. Um, doesn't do justice to the fact that in those years, credit was very much a lagging indicator of growth, not a leading indicator, right? So the question, I think the, the, thought, the thought process has to be, what was the impulse that led to the growth that led to the, uh, the credit? Um, the second point is, I think uh, Dr. Bazan said this already, the question is not where are the firms, the question is where are the large firms? And I keep pointing to Dr. Arvind Panagria's excellent example in his book from 10 years ago. You know, we all lament that Chinese real wages went up and we thought we'd do very well in textiles or the apparel industry. And as I showed earlier, our export shares have gone down dramatically out there. And he's got a great statistic in his book from surveys that in the Chinese apparel industry, more than 50% of people are employed in firm sizes of 500 and more. I think 30% is 2,000 and more. In India's case, 80% of people are employed in firms in that sector with less than eight people. So I think the, 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 the policy implication is, what is it that is preventing firms from becoming large, right? And I think in a way, the implications are invariant to the growth model you pick, whether it's domestic or external, because ultimately you want to push up total factor productivity, and all of us would argue, as Mr. Panda said, that the next set of reforms, almost tautologically, have to be in the factor market has to be land, has to be labor, has to be better allocation of credit and, and the banking system that you, that you spoke about. So I would frame the debate a little bit differently, that, uh, uh, that you know, if we believe larger firms are, 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 are more uh, uh, are productive, number one, what's preventing smaller firms from becoming large? And number two, which is implicit in, I think, Surjit's uh, uh, intervention is, you know, all of the growth in India, sadly, as viewed by the export basket, has been capital intensive. All the stuff that I showed earlier, pharmaceuticals, uh, engineering goods, very highly capital intensive firms. And I can point you 50 examples of these firms, right? The question is, you know, what's going to make growth being more labor intensive? What increases the labor intensity of every GDP growth? Point? Thank you. Thanks. Yes, Professor Joshi. Sorry, that, that last point uh, was, I thought, very important, uh, which has been raised by uh, Surjit as well. What is, uh, I mean, perhaps that's the most, one of the most critical economic questions, leaving aside the politics. What is going to make the em employment? I mean, what is going to make labor, uh, what is going to make growth more labor intensive? Uh, we know that East Asian industrialization was labor intensive. What, uh, what I'd like the panel's opinion on is, is that a road that is now much less uh, feasible? And what is the implication of, I mean, is, does India face another headwind in the form of automation and robotics? Uh, if so, what is the window for this uh, labor intensive growth? Thank you. Can I now call upon the panelists to respond? And oh, is there anyone else? If the others can put down their name plates, because it's now difficult to make out who spoke and who is not. So that leaves only. Yeah. Thank you. Regarding labor intensive, one of the things is that if you look at uh, development across the world. The process is agriculture uh, to uh, manufacturing to services. This is one country which has basically bypassed the manufacturing sector. 
And that accounts for a lot of the fact. Uh, this was actually pointed out to a gathering of IIT alums, which we were sitting there, uh, by Bill Gates. He said the big difference between China and India is the growth process is far more inclusive. If you have a so you can do something in the manufacturing sector, whereas in, 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 uh, for a service sector, the bottleneck is at least a high school education. And uh, the whole education process just does not supply um, enough people. So what's happening is that people who were, you know, the surplus labor in that thing, the wages have been bid up, and today that comparative advantage has become much less. And that shows in lower growth rate, because growth has to do with the rate of return, and, and when, when cost of labor goes up, uh, that, that goes down. The other thing is that the trickle-down effect um, has just not happened. Uh, and uh, this is something that I had once pointed out when I was discussing the Bosworth, Collins, uh, and Vermani paper years ago, that the, the median uh, voter in this country has not benefited through this process. The top 250 million to 300 million um, have had a ball, but it hasn't trickled down. So that has implications for policy. Thank you. Did you want to come in? Size of the bureaucracy. Uh, we'd spoken to an analyst a little while ago who gave us some figures of the central government. And when I put that into the population of Australia, which is, you know, where I'm from, it came to an alarming Commonwealth Public Service of about 7,900 people, which, um, as a Treasury officer, gave me chills to think, um, uh, uh, you know, how much that burden that puts on executive and the bureaucracy. But the question I wanted to, or the comment I wanted to make linked to that, the size of the bureaucracy is, um, and something that stood out to me from the last two days was, came up in the health uh, seminar looking at uh, setting a baseline for evaluation of policies. And with India having such a large structural reform agenda across the economy with many things happening at the same time, I'm just interested in the panel's views on the value of evaluation in that policy process. Thank you. Thank you. Now, Devesh, we'll start with you. We'll go in the same order, about two, three minutes each. So I think my own thinking is that, you know, we always so overstress, I think, growth. We all know its importance. Growth is a means to an end. And I think the quality of institutions, in my mind, what it does is, it affects, in a sense, the elasticity of the quality of life to growth. You know, you can have lots of growth with lots of pollution, uh, safety being very low, so people don't really feel they're getting a commensurate payoff in their improvements in the quality of life with the rapid growth rates. And I think that's a fair statement to make about how people feel. That look, growth of course has been robust for 25 years, but people don't feel that, you know, the quality of life has improved to that extent. And that's especially like for the average person. And that's where weak institutions, I think, I think matter. The, I completely agree with you, Dilip, that uh, there are many green shoots of which technology is one of them. Uh, I at least believe that, in fact, I think to some extent, part of this thing of the Indian bureaucracy being large and something that doesn't work, frankly, comes a lot from outside researchers who've really stuffed this thing about this so-called patronage state, patronage to democracy. Uh, it can't be very good at patronage if it's so understaffed. Uh, you know, every, you would think every politician would want to stuff their guys in government, but in fact, it's just the opposite. I don't know any other, 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 other democracy where politicians are so afraid of stuffing their own guys in government, otherwise it would be overstaffed, not understaffed. Uh, and I think the, to me, I think what's interesting is why is it so understaffed so persistently across government departments? You know, that's the interesting thing. It's not that you'll find some parts are severely overstaffed. 
uh, what I try to show you is across a range of areas, it's understaffed. Uh, 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 Dr. Krishnan might have some answers from his uh, work sort of in the finance ministry. We know that after 1992, the government took a stance, a severe stance on not increasing posts and on hiring. I mean, that was done. Some of this burden has fallen on contract labor, which is the way it has gone. Uh, but is, it, is the story only or solely fiscal? Uh, you know, why would you not want to employ 100,000 more people and sell <laughs> Air India because the amount you would save on the annual fiscal you know, support, you could hire about 100,000 more workers in health, but we will not you know, do that. What is it about a system that doesn't see these trade-offs which seem rather obvious? I'm not sure. Uh, and so I, you know, this is something I'm working on, but it seems to be rather obvious that th there are severe staff sh shortages. It's in everyone's interest to have at least a few more reasonably good people, and that's not happening. Thanks. I'll give uh, short answers to five questions that I picked up on. Uh, question at the end there is that, is there really more in a party democracy than we seem to see? Answer is, in talk, yes, not in deed, because of the anti-defection law that you talked about, that, that solved a genuine problem of the 1970s and 80s of instability with lots of members of parliament changing allegiance. But the uh, uh, unanticipated consequence was that uh, members of parliament or legislatures cannot vote as they wish. They have to vote by the party whip, otherwise they lose their membership. But in terms of what they can say in parliament, yes, there is plenty of democracy. So some of us have uh, advocated a tweak that the anti-defection law should continue because it did solve a major problem, but that the whip should not apply to anything other than money bills and votes of confidence because that is something members should owe their party. Everything else should be a conscience vote. Uh, the question about it's unfair to compare India and China, uh, I agree with you, uh, but there's no way that you cannot not compare the two countries that have more than a billion people population and two big engines of the global economy. But it is unfair, and particularly because of our systems being so different. Uh, it, it's almost like comparing an Olympian with somebody who competes in the Special Olympics because of all the restraints that we have. Uh, the only good news is in the last Paralympics two years ago, four of the distance runners actually did better timings than in the real Olympics. Um, Sujit's question as to uh, if one party were to get a majority, would we see a significant thrust on reforms? I believe yes. You know, if you look at the last 27 years, uh, you've had these bursts of reforms and those parties didn't get re-elected. You had Narasimha Rao didn't get re-elected in 1996. You had Vajpayee not get elected in 2004. If the cycle is broken, uh, if this government is re-elected, I believe that you will see that thrust which comes from a continuity of two terms. Even if, they, even if they fall short only by about 25 or 30, 35 seats, because that's just enough that you can have a coalition with one party rather than 20 parties. And so it can be much more decisive. So I believe yes. Uh, have we missed the bus for labor intensive employment? We missed the big bus, but I think there are still auto rickshaws available. Uh, because yes, AI, machine learning and all have changed the nature of the game, which is why we've been having the conversations we've been having about UBI, but I think there is still plenty of potential for labor intensive growth if we remove the shackles that we have put uh, ourselves. Anybody, any economist here who doesn't believe that labor law makes a difference, please come and spend a month with any enterprise that employs more than a hundred people in India and you will be a believer. Uh, Devesh, I uh, now find something I disagree with you on this. Uh, otherwise, I generally agree with everything you've said. Patronage. Patronage is not in the number of jobs that politicians uh, acquire for their people, but in the cuts that they arrange for their supporters. Let me give you an example. As a member of parliament, I have been doing quarterly reviews as we are entitled to, but most of my colleagues don't. Every time I reviewed a school, I found between 20 to 40% fake students. Do the math. 
between 20 to 40 percent fake students. Why? So you can bill them for uniforms, you can bill for midday meals, you can bill for uh, everything else. And this applies to all the hundreds of governmental programs that we have. The patronage comes with the local cronies. The patronage comes with the local contractors. And, and the system, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree with you about the number of people that we have. We, ne we need many times more. I think we need about four times the number of judges that we have. We need at least twice the number of policemen and women that we have. But in terms of the desk jobs that we have, where level after level after level, people just keep on making notes in the files, I think we could do with less. Thank you, sir. Here. Thank you. Um, thanks for the comments. A um, couple of quick responses. Uh, to charity, I think it is interesting to think about why we focus on China. But if we are going to be talking about sustained 8% growth rates, then the relevant comparator is China. Um, so if that's what we're going to be talking about, that's what we should be comparing ourselves to. Um, second to Surjit, you know, the price of tomatoes kind of thing, you know, two things to say. One is um, there is a real disjunction between um, growth rates and these large firms. So yes, China's 4x. I mean, the ratios we're talking about are 10 or 20x on the presence of large market cap firms. It's not explained by some relative side. And that is the real question, which is why is there a disjunction in my mind? Uh, the real question is why is there a disjunction between very, very strong growth over a long period of time and the, uh, the absence of these firms? So at, on your point about the price of tomatoes and what does it have to do with anything, um, I think two things. One is it's not just there, right? So, I mean, look at the returns to alternative assets in India. Look at the returns to private equity. Look at the returns to venture capital in the last 20 years. I mean, Flipkart is being sold for 16 billion, something like that. You look at aggregate returns in these investment areas, it's pretty, it's pretty grim. So it's, 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 it's about firm growth trajectories, as Sajid was, was kind of, I think, getting at. And of course, why we care about it is any kind of, you know, standard IO trade kind of model or melts like model, let's say, generates a hierarchy of firms which is you have small, low productivity domestic firms, you have higher, larger, sorry, higher productivity, larger exporters, and then you have super high productivity, very large multinational firms. So it's about measuring the productivity of your firms. That's because it's gonna be manifest in these large global firms. That's why we care. And we care because um, these narratives matter. So this goes to Sajid's point, which is, if in fact, you know, we're gonna be living in an eight or 7% world, then we can A, live fiscally in a certain way, um, and B, we can have expectations that we're gonna live in that way. And if instead it's not true, then we shouldn't be living in that way. And in particular, I think it matters not just for fiscal issues, but for expectations. I mean, in the US, you know, we, we're having a revolution of, of rising expectations, as de Tocqueville, you know, said. And I think we suffer from that problem here. Uh, the biggest problem is disappointment. And, and I think we're, we're dangerously verging on that. And then on Sajid's timing, I think it actually does work. And I didn't kind of go through all this. You're right, no model is gonna like account for everything. And I'm not gonna suggest that. Although I think in your paper, you make pretty strong claims about exports being the contributing um, driving. I think the timing does work and it explains even the outperformance of India post global financial crisis. Um, so I think it does kind of fit. And then on labor intensive and capital intensive, you know, I'm, I'm not at all interested in fetishizing uh, labor-intensive uh, sectors for many reasons. One is, you know, manufacturing shares of GDP are, are declining all around the world. Second, um, I'm in general not a, fa a fan of fetishizing certain kinds of industries because it can go, you know, wrong in, in 10 different ways. Thank you, Mihir. Uh, Mr. Berry. Um, well, uh, dogs that didn't bark, I was, um, you know, I would have liked some a response to my suggestion that what we needed was to think about a China policy, but just uh, to the points that were made, uh, let me just uh, sort of say that, uh, you know, in the sense, Asia has grown because of integration with the world and also regional integration. Uh, the big play out there is integration between India and China. Our private sector, you know, uh, will oppose that tooth and nail. But that's, that's the big trade that's out there. And I think for us to sort out uh, 
in the way that Europe is doing uh, about, so what are the rules of engagement with China? How do we uh, operate in three countries? I would have thought that that was a fairly big uh, issue for the next uh, four or five years. Uh, I just wanted to, in, to endorse, uh, well, to make two points. One is I totally agree with Pranab that building on what um, Avinash uh, Dixit had to say, that our race is with ourselves and a metric of that race is what it does to our democracy. I'm reminded of one of the comments that was made uh, at Nimrana by, I think, by one of the American uh, uh, political scientists uh, talking about um, the late 19th century in the United States. You know, people didn't know anything about growth, but what the, the metric for what they wanted uh, for themselves was something that would consolidate their democracy. So that, I think, is a litmus test for, for us. And therefore, uh, to come back to Surjit's point, uh, I mean, I'm not quite clear whether he was, whether he was, uh, whether the question was, do institution mat institutions matter, or is it that institutions have deteriorated? But there is a sense along uh, in the room and in the podium that there's extreme dissatisfaction of Indians with their institutions, with their lot, and with their political culture. And then you look at what the Pew uh, survey says, which is that the institution that's most trusted in India is government and then the army. So I don't actually see the kind of alienation from the state that, um, that is implicit in the, in the uh, uh, in the discussion here. But since I'm standing between you and high tea, I'd better quit. Thank you, Suman. And let me first thank all my panelists and all the participants for this excellent discussions. And Shekhar, you'll have noticed, other than Karthik sitting next to you, nobody ran out for coffee. Uh, if I were to sort of try and summarize the key points in a sentence each, uh, Devesh emphasized I think near unanimity on strengthening of public institutions and improving state capacity. I think Mr. Panda's point about, and I think it got lost in the discussions, the importance of focus, uh, given the sort of large list of topics, what is it that uh, uh, government in, say, 1924 can do? He drew attention to labor laws and agriculture. And uh, I think the point about how does one, uh, how does India grow the myriad small firms into internationally competitive big firms is, is an important, clearly important takeaway. And the point made by Mr. Berry about the need for India to engage more constructively with international institutions is, I think, well taken. And uh, Paradoxically, in this uh, usual framing of state versus markets, uh, as I sort of uh, end up concluding in a lot of such discussions, paradoxically, it seems to be that we need more of state and we need more of markets. Clearly, a better state and deeper markets, and which is probably what the polity led by Mr. Panda will bring about. Thank you. And We've concluded at 3.45. Yeah. We'll